Um, thank you. I'm Julie Linden, and on behalf of Daniel Dollar and Sarah Tedesco and myself, uh, we'd like to thank you, Sarah Thomas, for inviting us to participate. And thank you very much to Susan Cassidy, Francesca Frey, Monica Key, and their colleagues for handling the local arrangements so beautifully. It's really an honor to be here with you all today. And um, yes, we don't have a single respondent. You all are the respondents. Um, we're especially pleased to contribute to this part of the program focused on planning facilitated collections. Lorcan's talk yesterday really resonated with us. When he says that collections have been central to library identity, we get that at Yale. Right. So as Lorcan said, print logic leads to this perception that the bigger the local collection, the better in the sense of a good collection, a more good collection. And Tom spoke to this as well this morning. So if you go by Ariel statistics, Harvard's collection must be better than Yale's. And Yale's must be better than most everybody else's. So Dan Hazen thought and wrote about these ideas throughout his career. In 1992, in the Journal of Academic Librarianship, he published an essay titled, Is Money the Issue? Research Resources and Our Collections Crisis. And I really like that it's not the collections crisis, it's our collections crisis that we're all in this together and that it's in our best interests to work collaboratively were constant themes in Dan's work. So one of the headings in that 1992 article was obsolete models, and I'd like to quote at some length from that section. So quote, libraries have perceived themselves as essentially and necessarily autarkic. With self-sufficiency the mandate, the ideology of bigger is better has quite reasonably reigned supreme. Librarians and scholars alike have felt that any library could, given the institutional mandate and large but finite resources, acquire enough of the relevant subject literatures to fully support local research. Dan goes on to say, however, our arguably golden age of predictably expanding collections of books and journals, fixed rosters of disciplines, and foreseeable user demands, if indeed it ever existed, is past. End quote. 24 years later, Lorcan notes that print logic still shapes our thinking about collections. Even though so much content that's important to our users is not print, is not local, is perhaps not owned, this print logic still shapes our thinking. Yes, we still talk about the number of volumes in our local collections to prospective students, visitors, new faculty, and we talk about the amazing diversity of what we have in those collections. And I think we talk about those things more than we talk about the number of volumes that we can access through our resource sharing networks. I do think we tout the amazing diversity of what we can access online, but often with a very local or even siloed focus. Uh, as Lorcan notes, our licensed collections are, like our print collections, outside in. How many e-journals, e-books, databases, et cetera, are accessible at Yale? How does that compare to what Harvard licenses for its users? More? Better? So network logic and the concept of the facilitated collection are incredibly useful in helping us to give us a different frame for our thinking. Today, in this presentation, we are going to focus on the shared collection, in particular, the emerging Ivy Plus collective collection. In the summer and fall of 2014, Dan Hazen was instrumental in developing a proposal for what was then called the Borrow Direct Library, so building on the Borrow Direct service that had been around for more than a decade by then. Uh, and Dan was also instrumental in presenting this proposal to the Ivy Plus Library Directors. That proposal asked whether the Borrow Direct service should, uh, the Borrow Direct partnership, should continue to focus primarily on its original purpose of resource sharing, or in addition, pursue large-scale collaborative collection development initiatives. A major outcome of that proposal was the creation of the Ivy Plus Library's Director of Collection Initiatives position, which helps make it possible for the 13 Ivy Plus libraries to collaborate more formally, more systematically, and at a quicker pace. So a transformation like this, from print logic to network logic, requires not only the conceptual shift, the vision, but also operational changes. At Yale, as we work through these changes at so many levels, we've benefited from Dan's thoughtfulness and his steady record of contributions to the literature. As others have noted, Dan's writing tackles the big picture, the vision, the transformed environments in which we develop collections, 
and the operational changes we need to make in order to address these complex conditions. His 2009 discussion paper and action plan, Rethinking Collections in the Harvard College Library, a policy framework for straightened times and beyond, exemplifies Dan's approach. As was already mentioned, this seven-year-old paper is still highly relevant, and we are grateful that Dan shared his thinking with the research library community. So within that paper, there's a section that Dan titled The Elements of Action. He begins that section with a call for using data to inform collecting priorities. Now, specifically, he brings together qualitative data from, quote, inclusive consultations with faculty, students, and other collections constituencies, end quote, with quantitative data. His examples of quantitative data include WorldCat data to understand the content of our collections, circulation statistics to understand an aspect of use of the collections, and interlibrary loan and purchase request data to understand expressed user needs. Over the past few years at Yale, we've been doing a lot of the work that Dan called for in that 2009 action plan. Today, we'll describe for you elements of our collection assessment program, which we're developing in order to better understand our collections, to better understand user behavior and needs, and to help us plan with our Ivy Plus partners for a collaborative collections future. We have a past history of looking at collections data in a conspectus way, but now we are building models that bring together data from disparate sources that help us understand user engagement with collections, not just the locally owned collection, but the facilitated collections as well. We are still in the early days of this approach to collections assessment, and there's a lot of work to do. For every lens we turn on the data, every visualization that deepens or furthers our understanding, for every answer we generate more questions. We will pose some of these questions at points throughout our talk, and we hope that they might serve as starting points for a conversation with you today. There's a lot of work to tackle together, and we are energized by Dan's unflagging advocacy for collaborative work to transform academic library collecting. As he put it in his 2011 article, Lost in the Cloud, shared analysis and coordinated plans can help ensure that the essential functions of research libraries, identifying, providing access to, organizing, delivering, and preserving recorded knowledge continue to be fulfilled. So now rest your eyes on these clouds and take a deep breath. Uh, Daniel Dollar is going to begin the guided tour of selected aspects of our emerging collections assessment program. Thank you, Julie, and um, thank you all again for being here and for the invitation. Uh, Sarah. All right. Um, let's see. I've got lots of things here. Slide these out. So we've divided the remainder of the talk into five main sections, and I'll take you through collection development, circulation, e-resources, and then uh, run from the podium and uh, turn it over to uh, Sarah Tedesco, who will talk about German language materials and uh, borrow direct. But I want to stop for just a moment and sort of better frame uh, what we're going to be moving into. Um, I want to make a, a couple of points. One, collections are a service. They're not an end unto themselves. Um, collection development needs to be data informed, not data driven. So we want to bring together um, the quantitative and qualitative information as uh, Dan Hazen so well articulated. Um, we believe that the concepts of inside-out library and the facilitated collection are, have a lot of power to help us shape and further our professional uh, dialogue. And I want to turn for a moment, though, and, and just read the first sentence of uh, the Yale University Library's collection development statement, or philosophy statement. Uh, Yale University Library collects, organizes, and preserves, and provides access to a rich and unique record of human thought and creativity in a variety of formats in support of teaching, research, and the public missions of the university. So we see our role uh, as trying to support the rich, dynamic, and interdisciplinary uh, intellectual life at Yale, and by extension, the wider scholarly community. So, collection spending. Uh, money is a vehicle in service of the library's mission. And so how do we deploy that 
reflects institutional decisions and values, and it also reflects to uh, a great extent the financial and material contributions made by generations of donors. When it comes to financial matters, we can often have some hesitation over what and how much to share. We share collection development budgets, and we may note the annual percentage change in those numbers. Um, and this is similar um, to one of the beautifully restored stained glass windows at the, uh, at the uh, Sterling Memorial Library. It's translucent, but not transparent. Yeah. Oh, I got a laugh. Um, we need a better understanding of collection spending at our respective institutions, and I hope the next set of slides will help better illuminate collection activity at Yale. So let's start at a very high level view of library collection expenditures as drawn from our, our university's financial system, it's Oracle Financials. Um, I will just note throughout the slides, we divisions by year or fiscal year, which for Yale is July 1st through June 30. So uh, this is a lot, but it's not quite everything. Um, we did not pull in the law library. So actually, if you go to 2014 and you throw on a uh, two and a half million, then you get up to the 38 million that we reported to ARL that year. So, so taking a look at this, um, I'll start with the super obvious of um, we spend a lot on collections. Um, but going beyond that, you can see in the previous decade, the run-up, uh, the increasing amount of funding going to collections before the financial crisis. You can kind of see where that is and how we've sort of rebounded back um, somewhat gradually, but rebounded back from that point. Um, you can also note that 40% of our budget goes to special collections. Um, that's rare materials, monographs, I mean manuscripts and archival materials about 35% to e-resources, and approximately 20% to uh, print monographs. Uh, what you don't see here is that the majority of the funding is derived from endowed income, and this has been accentuated by the financial crisis of 2008. Some of the endowments are restricted to collections, yay, uh, with a subset tied to specific subject areas, but we also use other endowed funds that are broader in scope. The bulk of our special collections expenditures, the 40%, uh, is accounted for by the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library. This is all funded through endowed funds that are restricted to the acquisition of antiquarian archival materials. The funding behind the acquisition of special collections is transformative. Um, we continue to build extraordinary collections of primary source materials primarily in the humanities. Special collections held by the Beinecke, Manuscripts and Archives, and other library special collection units are a rich source of scholarship for the wider scholarly community. And to echo uh, one of Tom's comments, um, a significant portion of the researchers who use these collections are from outside of Yale. So I just point this out so that you, you really cannot fully appreciate Yale's collection uh, expenditures without understanding the place of Beinecke within this context. Now, the Yale University Library begins to look a little bit more like other academic research libraries once we remove Beinecke. And Beinecke is not included in any of the following slides. So with Beinecke removed, um, we see it for 2000, in 15, about 67% uh, of our collection development budget went to the acquisition of e-resources. We can see this transition uh, a little more clearly in highlighting these two uh, lines on the graph. Uh, in the middle part of the last decade, we saw the transition uh, from print serials to e-resources as the dominant um, acquisition format. And this was driven in large measure by the sciences and medicine moving to, from print to E only for their journal collections. Um, print uh, monograph spending peaked in the last decade and has dropped back to uh, pretty much the same level it was, the same uh, spending amount as it was 15 years ago. However, this does not include uh, expenditures for ebooks. So turning to a different data source, 
um, to get a better understanding of the migration from analog to digital formats, let us turn to information drawn from our library's integrated library system. We use Voyager. Uh, the expenditure type data pulled out of Voyager was revised in 2013 to allow for greater granularity um, and a better understanding of how e-resource spending was going on. We realized that we needed to change the expenditure types when, when the expenditure type starts with machine readable. I was like, hmm. So machine readable monograph, machine readable serial. So we, we introduced uh, some more granularity. And what that revealed for us is that book and serials, print and electronic formats combined as percentages are actually fairly stable. Um, the revised expenditure types revealed that a significant portion of the budget was going to other digital formats, databases, digitized archival content, streaming video, et cetera. Uh, the, for, the new formats uh, allow for different types of engagement with collections by our users, and um, we also are seeing the challenge as we repurchase uh, the same content in new formats, in some cases from print to microfilm to digital. Uh, and plus, at this point, we also want the raw data, if we can get our hands on it, to support text and data mining and allow other uses tied to digital scholarship. However, the shift from print to online has not yet occurred in, in a large-scale way with monographs. Shown here, we can see serial and monograph spending as of 2015. So closest to me here is the serials, no surprise. Uh, you can look at monograph spending, it's about 85% print. Uh, we could actually, I could actually strip off monographs and put serials on that graph and slap the label of 20, 2003 and it would be the exact same. It's like, this is where uh, serial printing, serial acquisitions were uh, about 13 years ago. So circulation. So we're gonna move now from budget to use. And for this section, we will explore data associated with the engagement um, of users with local research collections. First, uh, by looking at print monograph collections and then turning to the wider community engagement trends with um, what are becoming shared collections. I'll stop here to insert one of the questions that we hope to discuss at uh, greater length uh, after our discussion. Uh, how best do we understand and support the needs of our users, at our user communities. We hear and we read a great deal about the continuing importance of print, but what is the data showing us? We certainly continue to purchase um, print, as shown by the continuing growth of print monograph collections, about a 44% increase uh, since 2002. Again, this is data pulled from Voyager and. 2002 was the first full year we were using that system. At the same time, um, we're witnessing a gradual sloping off, or what appears to be a gradual sloping off, of total circulations by the library's primary user communities. Now let's take um, a closer look at these uh, groups individually. So, circulation to graduates. Um, and this is our largest group. Uh, in terms of circulations, probably the same for you as well. Um, since 2002, we hit a high point in circulation in 20, 2011, and since, since then, it's dropped by 29%. See the same thing with faculty. Um, 2006 was a high point, 40% drop. Undergraduates, um, the highest level of circulation was actually in 2002. Uh, it sort of held close to that, and since 2006, it's been dropping 49% drop since that time. So when we look at all of these groups combined, um, we can see that there's been a 33% drop in circulation um, since uh, in, over the past 15 years. An exception is uh, resource sharing, uh, with a 144% increase over the exact same time period. So let's turn now to explore this wider uh, community engagement with local collections, and which highlights aspects of the facilitated collection articulated by Lorcan Dempsey. So we're just look, starting off with the last six years. Uh, so from uh, 2011 to 2016, 
we have a, we see a 25% um, drop. But can we, let's drill down a little bit and see what's going on inside those numbers. So we find that 12% of the circulations are materials borrowed, um, primarily through borrow direct or through interlibrary loan. A further 13% uh, are circulations of loans of Yale collections to other users, primarily borrow direct. So we find um, in 2016, and actually the past few years, that a quarter of all of our circulation activity is being facilitated through a network, primarily borrow direct. And Sarah uh, Tedesco will take a deeper dive into borrow direct data uh, later in this session. Now, is that the whole story? Well, there's always more. It's never ending. But um, we added uh, onto the numbers um, scanning requests. Um, because we have a service, Scan and Deliver. It became a um, campus-wide service in 2013 as a substitute to requesting the physical item. So we need to account for this. So here we can see that it, it um, has taken off and it is a, a portion of our other activity. Once we count in Scan and Deliver, then we have a 23% drop over this time period. So I'll insert a question here, another question. Um, in light of declining circulation, how do we determine what to collect uh, in print, individually and collectively? And I'm gonna do a full stop, and I'm gonna insert that and make explicit something that is implied in this question. It is not suggesting that we're gonna stop buying print, okay? All right? I can... uh, <laughs> very good. I can. I know. All right? This is nice. I like the nice podium. It's good. Good, strong podium. Yeah, that's, yeah. So anyway, but it, it's an important question that I hope we can wrestle with some today. E-resources. We've been looking at metrics of user engagement with print books. Um, let us move now to metrics of user engagement with licensed electronic resources. We'll start again at a high level and then we'll illustrate the changing climate through a case study. So starting at the bottom of this graph, we have circulation numbers. It's all the circulation numbers that I'd previously shown. Next is uh, ebook usage drawn from counter BR2 reports for section or chapter requests from 11 publishers and platforms that actually provide counter usage data. So we have some ebook platforms we all do that don't, in, don't provide counter data. Uh, that's not included. And then we have at the top article downloads uh, drawn from counter JR1 and JR1A reports for the 18 largest uh, publishers and platforms by usage. And again, this does, this does not include all of the journal platforms where we can pull counter stats. Now, I understand. You're sitting there saying, that's apples and oranges, Daniel. So I, I, found, a, I found an image. Um, yes. Um, you know, when we look at these circulation numbers versus article um, chapter downloads, the point is not a straight comparison. I'm not trying to make a comparison. I'm just trying to note the orders of magnitude between e-journal and e-book usage and how that turns our circulation numbers into a flat line that's skewered at the bottom of the graph. There's just a massive um, scale. So let us look at this phenomenon in a different way through the following case study. So I'll start with eBury Academic Complete. Uh, it represents one of the first licensed eBook resources. Uh, the interface is not a favorite. Yes, you may laugh. Uh, it's not a favorite among librarians or users, uh, although there's been a uh, a recent uh, revision of their interface, uh, for what that's worth. Um, it covers a wide variety of disciplines, including humanities and social science. Um, 
It currently provides access to more than 137,000 titles, primarily in English. And when we look at usage by section downloads or chapter downloads, um, at Yale, since 2010, we've seen a 170% increase in use, um, or number of downloads. And the downloads coming from about 40% of the collection. I'm gonna switch to another collection. This is the ANT and Robert M. Bass Library at Yale University. Um, Bass Library is a two-level facility located under Cross Campus in front of the Sterling Memorial Library. Bass was completely renovated, thank goodness, uh, completely renovated in 2007. It contains reserves and we also have an open reserve system that's housed in the stacks at Bass. Uh, it houses materials taught most commonly in Yale College as well as books by faculty. Uh, it covers a wide variety of disciplines, including humanities and social sciences. It currently provides access to more than 137,000 titles, primarily in English. Um, and we consider it an intensive use collection, um, not an undergraduate library, because um, we find that usage of the collection is pretty evenly distributed in terms of circulation with undergraduates and graduate students. Circulation, though, since 2010 has dropped by 45%. Although a larger portion, you can see 66% of the material in that collection has been used. So, again, just to put things side by side. Um, for, so, Ebrary and Bass, in terms of number of titles, language, subject composition, are quite similar, really eerily so. We did not move books out of Bass to get to 137. I mean, it's just very interesting that way. Um, we see are seeing increasing user engagement through downloads of an ebook product where convenience, where it apparently convenience and greater accessibility seem to be um, outweighing limitations imposed by the resources <laughs> interface and digital rights restrictions. At the same time, um, Yale's intensive use quote unquote, library, is experiencing a major decrease in user engagement with the collections as measured by circulation. So I will leave you with that view, and I'm going to now step away from the podium and invite Sarah Tedesco to come up. Another deep breath before we dive into even more data. We're gonna talk about the German language collections at Yale. Um, a few years ago, um, I was approached to sort of evaluate the German language collections from a couple of different people. Everybody was interested in this topic. I learned later that there had been an Ivy Plus conversation about German language uh, collections in a collective way, and I think some of that had spurred some thinking about what's going on with this particular subset of collections. This was part of a larger project where I actually investigated a lot of Western European uh, collections. So this is just a small subset of that. If you're interested in more data, come and see me later. I have more. All right. The German language uh, monograph collections encompasses many subject areas. Language and literature, economics, politics, science, and medicine as some of the major uh, components of this particular collection. And the collection has grown steadily over the past 13 years. All right, we saw overall circulation trends. This is the German language circulation trends. So basically just taking that little subset of stuff and say, all right, so what kind of circulation activity is this material getting? Um, as you can see, there's been some significant changes. Let's start with the graduate students. Graduate students, overall usage from 2002 to now for all collections is down 21%. For the German language collections, it's down 38%, a much bigger drop than in, a, in the regular, and then the, the collections as a whole. The faculty usage of German is down 30%. In a slight reversal, in 2002, their overall circulation rate has dropped 35%. So it's been a little bit of a smaller drop for the faculty community for this particular subset of collections. 
Resource sharing is the only area of growth. So more of our German language collections are going out to the community for usage at other libraries by other patrons. Undergraduates have always been a very tiny proportion of usage of this particular collection, um, but they've seen a 64% decline overall. Their overall decline, as Daniel said, is about 50%. I wanna look at German language collections in a slightly different way. What we did is we took every single book that was purchased from 2003 to 2015, it's German language, and we asked it one question. Has it ever gone out to a patron? If the answer was yes, it's in the blue section. If the answer is no, it's in the orange section. As you can see, the ones that have been sitting on the shelves the longest in this particular subset of collections has circulated about 17% of the material is circulated. Stuff in 2015 has only been on the shelves for a couple of months, depending on when it was acquired. And right now it has a level of usage about 2%, and we expect that to grow. However, looking at the overall circulation trends, I wanna ask the question, are we ever gonna see a 17% usage of this collection in the future? I also want to ask how much in the orange section are materials in other libraries that are also not been used, but have also been collected over the years? And is this an opportunity for likely a, sh a shared print environment? So uh, one of our other questions, how should we approach collecting Western European language materials? Are they becoming a type of special, or maybe specialer collection might be a better term? Now I'm gonna segue and I'm gonna talk a little bit about BorrowDirect. A lot of us here are involved in the BorrowDirect program and it is, a, it is an incredible program and seen incredible growth over the years. Yale was one of the original members of BorrowDirect along with Columbia and the University of Pennsylvania. As more institutions joined and ramped up their participation, you can see in this graph the growth institution by institution with the last one being Duke, and I believe Stanford is going to be coming on board soon. So that'll be really interesting to see the data as it grows. Yale's growth has been considerable. This is um, the data that we're analyzing at Yale to see how our community is engaging with the borrowed deck direct collections. The service has grown steadily from 2000 to 2014. However, over the past few years, we've seen a leveling off and now a slight decline. Even though the service has grown, increasing the availability of common collections and access, we know some, from some of the other trends we've been observing that we're seeing some differences in the way people engage with print collections, and I think it might be starting to impact BorrowDirect. We don't know what this means for the future, but it'll be interesting to gauge this over the next few years to see if the patterns start to hold. Now this graph is actually exactly the same as the other one because everything that was borrowed was lent by somebody. But um, there's a little bit of, if you actually look at them side by side, you'll notice that there are some institutions that um, actually lend out more of their materials than they borrow. Um, MIT and Dartmouth are two really good examples of that. If we put Yale's borrow and lending side by side, you kind of get a sense of how the network works. The lending side uses automation to distribute the load among the partners. We've increased the amount of material that we lend as the program has grown, but Nail has been a net borrower for most of the life of the BorrowDirect program. Demographics of BorrowDirect are very similar to the demographics of our local collections. Graduate students are the big honking meat of this particular program. They borrow a ton of material from, from all of you in the BorrowDirect network. BorrowDirect is a flexible program, and in the reporting data a few years ago, they added a field that tells us whether a local Yale item was attached to the request as it was made. Um, I think like many of you, Yale allows um, people to borrow materials, even if we own a copy locally, if that copy happens to be checked out to another patron, if that copy happens to be missing or lost, maybe it's part of a collection that's severely restricted, we give people the opportunity to request those materials through Borrow Direct, and people take advantage of that. So it, looking at the, the green and the gray in our, in our little pie chart, I can just tell you a little story about what some of these materials might be. So if something is not available at Yale, 
and may not ever be in the future. It might be an older material, a much more obscure item, or it's just not something that would be a part of our general collection development policy. That will be in the gray area. However, it could be that the item is just not available at Yale at the time of the request, but it may be coming in in the next few weeks or the next few months. There's a lot of that in the gray as well. There might be stuff that's available at Yale, but are actually associated with a completely different bibliographic record because of the complexities of technical services and lots of different versions of things that are out there. I'm sure we've all encountered that in BorrowDirect. That would also be in the gray. However, in the green is the things that Yale actually does have a local item for, or had at one point had a local item for that. And as you can see, it's a considerable amount of the material that we're borrowing through BorrowDirect. That leads us to our, actually our last question, which is are there efficient and scalable methods for building facilitated questions? We're gonna dive a little bit more into borrow direct data, but I'd like you to think about that as we keep going. Borrow direct. Um, a lot of the material that Yale is borrowing was published in the last 25 years. I think that's true for a lot of institutions. When we examine the top five subject areas that are borrowed, through BorrowDirect, um, we really observe a, a healthy mix of humanities and social science. And if you look at the local availability, there's a good local availability for all of these subjects. There's no, we, when we dive into this data, we're not really seeing big gaps. It was one of the things we were trying to explore at one point. So I wanna segue now and talk a little bit about how BorrowDirect fits into our overall picture of our scholarly community. When we go back to our graduate students, we can see that now, in 2016, the year just ended, the fiscal year that's just ended, about 17% of all of the material they circulated came from the BorrowDirect network. The same holds true for faculty. They were a little bit more of a reluctant starter. They were a much smaller proportion, but it's grown considerably, and now they're almost at 9% of all of their loans are from BorrowDirect. And undergraduates, although overall circulation for them has really fallen off over the past few years, they are certainly using BorrowDirect as well. All right, so I'm gonna leave you with a, a different window. This is a skylight and um, a lot more transparent, sort of looking up to the sky and looking up to the future. Um, so I wanna ask a couple of questions. What does this mean? We had questions before we started exploring the data we may have answered some of the questions, but um, oftentimes when you start exploring data, it just leads to more questions. Do the circulation trend patterns signal a significant shift in the way research communities are engaging with print collections? What's the impact from discovery? Yale has deployed new discovery systems over the past few years. Our electronic resources have grown and changed to include those new types of materials that Daniel had talked about things like data sets and things that are being used for text and data mining. We've developed new collection services to help people to connect with our print collections, services like Scan and Deliver. What is the impact of the increasing availability of eBooks, even in what many of us would agree are substandard formats and user interfaces? I read discussions and review surveys in the consumer and library media all the time about the preferences for print. When I look at the trends, I'm seeing something happening that doesn't necessarily match up with the, that qualitative assessment. I also believe that there's a lot of nuance to this data, and the reality is that sometimes a researcher wants it all. They want the print, they want the, and they want the E, they want to use them for different reasons, and it's really difficult sometimes to observe that nuance in data. We've shared just some of Yale's data along with the questions we're contemplating. And like I said, it's only part of the story. We're hoping that it generates some really interesting responses from you. Um, but it's helped us to orient our ideas and our strategies and discussions around what we're observing in our community of scholars and how we're going to approach that in the future. So I'm gonna come back to our four questions, but you are not limited to those four questions, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and uh, we do not have a respondent because you are a respondent. So I'm gonna ask the question, and who would like to get us started with our discussion? All right. We have to wait for the microphone people to get ready, okay. Hi, thanks very much to all of you. This is uh, a lot of food for thought.
I'm actually going to zero in on the Western European language question, and it kind of follows on a question I would have asked Tom if there had been time. I was planning to grab him at the break. We could bring but him I, up. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why, uh, first of all, why you chose German, and second, why you would limit this question to Western European language materials and why not uh, just go to area studies materials, because that's been discussed, as you know. Yeah, that has been discussed. I, uh, we wanted to keep our focus um, on, I don't know what you'd call the, the general collections. Area studies is, we have, and we have data with area studies as well, but the German language one really came up specifically because of the Ivy Plus discussions about collective collections. That's gonna be talked about later. So I focused in on that, but I said, we really looked at the data for all of those different areas. And it, it, they, they are very specialized areas. And so trying to understand that data is really, uh, it's really a process. And it's been, we're beginning that process for all the areas, but we have a lot more to explore. Um, I did a, a talk um, at ALA Midwinter where I, I did a similar sort of analysis of German, French, and Italian. So I sort of did all of that language group together. I think that's why the Western European language thing stayed. Spanish was a little different. Spanish is, is a little bit more complicated. Western Europe includes Spain. It didn't include Latin American stuff until recently, and we shifted our collections focus on our, the way that we organized the library. So it's a very recent change. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me, Liz Mengel from Johns Hopkins. Um, I think what's really interesting in your data, and we've just been working on a renovation, so we've been pulling lots of the same kind of data, is that ours does not track really any different than what you have. We have a deep drop in circulation in 2008. Yours comes a little earlier, a little later for your different groups. But um, I, I think you're right in that researchers want both the electronic and the print. And how do we understand and support the needs of our users? This is, I think, where we really need to be getting user experience out there and doing these tests and having and working with faculty to, to have them look at almost this data and start asking what's going on. How are you doing your research? How are you changing your research? What are you gonna be doing in the future? I think that's really important for us to understand because you can't just look at that data without pulling in the rest of the context. I would say it's pretty comparable at, at Cornell, similar kind of uh, trajectories. Um, the borrow direct uh, information is really, really valuable. The, the convenience of being able to not inconvenience another person by recalling a book, uh, but still about half of it is distinctive, not part of Yale. Um, and that do, does sort of um, confirm our understanding of our print collections as while they're large and massive, there's a lot of distinctiveness to them. I think in our electronic um, materials, you know, digital hegemony is really leading to digital homogeneity. and. The ability to look at distinctiveness across those uh, would be a very interesting uh, thing for me to hear more about. Um, but the point about uh, e-research um, uh, use, uh, e-resources use or e-journal use, I don't recall what your figures were, but I just looked at uh, uh, Yale's use of archive uh, in 2015. You were 33 in, uh, in use and you, downloaded 88,272 full text journals. That kind of thing, whether it's open or, or being paid for, should really also be factored, I think, in the use figures. Thanks. Yeah, I, I agree, I think that's an, yeah, I think that's an important, those are very important points, and um, um, particularly archive and other, um, open access initiatives. I think uh, Greg Yao had a great phrase, uh, open access patronage, and we are patronizing these initiatives such as Archive and the Open Library of Humanities and others. And we, we do want to understand how, uh, how users are engaging with those uh, initiatives as well. So um, I want to ask a deliberately provocative question. It may be a bit of devil's advocacy, 
but imagine I'm asking it from about 60,000 feet in the voice of the scariest provost you can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at these charts. Circulation's going down. All your print is being used less than it was. Yeah. Um, both in your German specialized collections and in your general collections. And I'm sure if you look at the something like 75 million books across all of Borrow Direct and took instead of Yale, but you ran the same kind of numbers for circulation across the whole system, you might see a similar pattern. Mm -hmm. So why did you start by saying, we're not gonna stop collecting print? I think we need to understand that research is, research can go in so many different directions. And so you, you can't silo things off, um, either by subject or by format. We still acquire a lot of material in microfilm because that's the way, that's the way we can provide access to it. Uh, and so that's what we're going to do. We're gonna go and try to support our community um, in the best ways that we can. What I see the, what I would counter that provost from on high would be what we are doing collectively, and I think as part of the conversation here, and I think, um, I see this gathering more and more steam, is that we are working, we need to work collaboratively on shared approaches to the acquisition of materials. So that when someone comes from on high, we have a plan or we are, we are able to talk intelligently about, you know, yes, we're acquiring um, in this particular imprint area or in this particular subject area um, and that's supporting our, our community, but it's also supporting the broader community. And in turn, the broader community is helping us in areas where we are not collecting as deeply. So I think I, one of the patterns we've seen with Bar Direct is that as time has gone by, we've been able to sort of loosen up our restrictions on what circulates. Um, internally, we have loosened up and liberalized our loan policies. Um, the three of us were having a conversation this morning, and I think one of the risks for us is we're not moving fast enough, that the world's going to get beyond us. In, uh, the, the data is very interesting, and it's, it's, it'd be great to get down from the macro level, down from you know, e-books, um, e-journals versus print, to kind of more domain-based studies. Um, We've, we've found a lot of um, anomalies when you get down to that level, uh, particularly over time. And then I noticed that a lot of your data was from a time period of about 15, you know, 12 to 15 years. But there are much longer cycles in the, um, the use of, of print materials that are have been, even archival materials, special collections materials. A lot of the literature of the, um, the fascist era in, in Western Europe was essentially pariah literature and just lay dormant in libraries for 40 years until in the 1970s and 80s people started getting interested in the growth of fascist ideology and all of a sudden those publications from the 30s and 40s in Germany and in Italy became really important. We've seen something recently with the literature of the print coming out of the uh, jihadist um, where, uh, certain parts of the world like Afghanistan and in Iraq and South Asia, Pakistan, where there's a, there's a big surge in use lately of um, publications from Pakistan, Afghanistan in the 1960s and 70s because people are studying the rise of, fat, of um, Islamist, radical Islam ideologies, that kind of thing. And so you know, once you get down to that level, you get some data that could be much more informative for, for decisions. Hi there, I'm uh, Neil Safir from the John Carter Brown Library in Providence, and I didn't know Dan Hazen, um, and so it's been wonderful to, uh, to learn a little bit about him and his scholarship. Uh, one of the things that I picked up on yesterday was his interest in collaboration um, between scholarly communities and institutional repositories, and I think that that's something that is interesting to at least throw into the mix here, uh, just to give him the sense that I'm a historian by training and now uh, working in a library setting, thinking about the transformations that are taking place in scholarly practice and how much, 
how little actually we know about the ways in which access to different kinds of electronic tools are changing the way that scholars uh, and everybody does research. I think we are so uh, so much at the beginning of that uh, of that revolution, uh, with so little data about the qualitative nature that scholars, uh, students, uh, general public. Um, uh, engage with different kinds of media that I would love to think that um, in addition to interinstitutional collaboration, which I think is a, has really been a theme here, that there be a, a new model for collaborating between different kinds of research communities and the people who, that, that, that are here who represent institutions. I don't know exactly what that would look like, but I think that Certainly within the historian's community, people are thinking a lot about how, um, how this is changing um, the way that people um, write about history, the, pe the way that people study history, research history. Um, and I would be very curious to, to know about models or, or, or ways that people are uh, in, engaging with that question. Yeah, I would just like to say to that and to some of the other comments raised that I think there's a further question for all of us about how we put resources into this kind of work. Where do those resources come from? And again, you know, you can see that a lot of what we have here is work we have done on Yale collections and to some extent on Borrow Direct. But, you know, how do we find that balance between the analysis we undertake collaboratively and what do we do individually? How do we set those priorities? Yeah. I, I think Dan would say this uh, uh, far more eloquently than I, but I think assessment needs to be a team sport. Um, so we need to, we're, we're making some progress internally and it took a lot of effort just to wrangle our own data sources and the own ways we count things internally um, to get to what we were showing you today. And again, there's more, but um, how do we begin to work across institutions and yes, even within scholarly communities to think about um, how materials are being used and, and can that inform our collection development decisions and, and also decisions around what are we going after in terms of special collections and where are we putting our emphasis in terms of preservation, um, things of that nature. Uh, hi, Dan. Uh, it's Carla over here. Um, I just want to draw out something that um, we've been thinking about uh, at Ohio State because we have some of the similar resource sharing. It's on the resource sharing side and how that should perhaps start to inform, not determine, our thinking about coordination in our collecting. Um, we have perhaps uh, longer term data uh, because of the age of the Ohio Link resource sharing activities. Um, and one of the things that you see here that we see in the Ohio Link data as well is a lot of the resource sharing activity is um, supporting duplication, you know, where uh, people need another copy that we didn't collect in the first place. Um, and so it's tricky to think about if we're going to reduce our, we can't predict what those things are. Um, if we knew the ones that we'd need three copies of, we would have bought three copies of. Um, so it's nice that we stopped worrying about that. But if we start to really talk about reducing the number of copies in the system collectively because of coordination of our buying, um, I wonder how that's going to influence our collision of um, you know, what turns out is a lot of what we bought isn't used, but then we underbought clearly in terms of number of copies. Um, and so it's great that in our networks, suddenly 20 copies can be used all at the same time in a single semester. Um, those 20 copies might be something new, but they might be something old that, as you know, Bernie pointed out, suddenly is relevant. And it's not just relevant to one scholar or one student, it's relevant to a community of scholarship. Mm -hmm. um, to where we start only acquiring three of them ever, what is that gonna do to that, that user need? Um, and I don't know what the answers are, but it's, I think it's relevant to this conversation about if we want to have more coordination, but what we see and what people are using our resource sharing for is actually to, um, increased kind of duplication. Yeah. Um, we're on a little bit of a collision course potentially there. 
Well, I, I think that it's, um, to me, we're doing the facilitated collection without, without the coordination, so it's scattered. Um, and I see the fact that we are able to provide uh, support people without having to buy the second or third copy as a win. That's a great thing. That, that allows me to allocate more funds to other material for us to acquire more titles or whatnot. Um, but yes, then the question becomes, okay, once you begin to coordinate this and you have conscious coordination, you know, how, what is the right number of titles? And I think we can use data and I think we, we have to be flexible but if we're, if we, I think if we continue to be lazy fair about this, then we're, if we pull back in certain ways and without that coordination, there are gonna be gaps. I can also, I just wanna to add to that, I think there's market forces at play as well. It's the shift from print to eBooks. It's starting to happen. We're getting more and more eBooks. Are those gonna be the things that people want multiple copies of? Maybe the maybe the maybe the the need for that multiple copy network system for a certain class of materials is going to go away in the next few years, and then you have the coordination of materials that are much more specialized. You know, there's not likely necessarily the need for 20 copies of something in the orange of the German language monographs within like a, a small region of the United States. There probably never was. So I think that you know you have to think about it by the types of collections that you're collecting as well. And I think that's another way to think about it. You really, it's a really complicated issue once you start divvying up the pie. So. Um, this is actually a follow-up on, uh, sorry, this is Dulce Smith from GW, uh, George Washington University. Follow-up on a previous question. Just want to get a little more granular with it maybe. Um, at GW, I think like many universities, there's a strong emphasis now to centralize data um, collection from various units on campus in a sort of data warehouse model. Um, and so in the library, even as we're just like you, sort of getting our own data in order, we're also facing the question of how might we enrich this data with data from other units on campus and what, I mean, I think that's both an operational question but also a kind of political ethical question. Um, so I've just wondered if you've, if you've taken any concrete steps in that direction or if you see any concrete steps on the horizon for, for you at Yale. We are definitely thinking about that. We are working very hard to try to get our data wrangled, so to speak. But the reality is, is that it's always, there's always gonna be a lot of chaos in the system. You're never gonna be able to get everything to fit into one mold and you have to sort of accept that and try to find the ways to crosswalk the data when appropriate. Um, the other thing that's important too is to be able to tie it to outside the library into the Office of Institutional Research so that you can gauge the trends in faculty, tenures, tenured faculty being added to the system, new subjects and new subject areas. Um, that's another area that we're looking really closely into because the reality is, is that, that, we're, that with this particular part of our program, we're tying it very closely to the university's research needs and we need to have that data in order to understand that better. So the answer is probably we're no further along than you. <laughs> Hi, I've been uh, working on some collaborative collection projects for Mexico and Brazil with colleagues in Borrow Direct, and I just wanted to make um, a, a plea for more uh, um, assessment of what we're doing, what our collective holdings are. It's very hard to get data out of OCLC or out of Borrow Direct because we have different systems, we're in different systems. I've worked with you, Sarah. Absolutely, to yeah. Mexico yeah. statistics for, for Yale. And um, it's, we can't get the data that we yeah. need at this point. Mm. We, we exact, you're exactly right. I, I was working with a, a colleague at Yale on that particular project, and the reality is, is that you know I come to I come to Yale's data. I have certain parameters available to me. Go to the Borrow Direct system; it's much more limited. Hopefully, initiatives in that area will make that stuff better. It's again, we're going to talk about that I think in some of the next sessions. So I, I really think there's hope on the horizon. But I said I keep asking for it. I think that's really what you need to do. We have to keep asking because. This data is not, right now it's still really hard to get at, and it shouldn't be. It really shouldn't be. If the, the, the easier this data is to get at, the more work we can do with it and trying to understand it, and then try to explode it out to other questions. I, 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 know, I know exactly what you're talking about. 
Michael, Michael Noga, MIT. Uh, when I ever look, when I look at all this data, the first question I ask is, ask is, does this meet my expectations? And then I say, what questions does it ask? Answer. And so one of the things, when you presented that data, the first thing I did was go to the German studies part of Yale. And the interesting thing is when you look at the graduate program, the first thing you see is this whole array of books. So it's kind of ironic there. What I'm thinking is happening is a number of things. Um, students are now going off into different directions. So they need, they in a German studies program, they're probably using things in, it said film, for example. They could be using something, who knows where, social theory or whatever. But there's a lot of that going on. They're also not having to go to the library and browse. And then when you're browsing, you see things you didn't expect. So they're not using that as much. Another thing is um, there, a lot of times when you're doing graduate research, you only need a piece of a book. You don't need to read this whole library. You need to read parts. And so the, the e-books do work well with that if you can find the right thing. So there's, I just keep saying, look at the data, but also keep questioning it. Don't take it and say that's it. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. I think that that, that that nuance, that changing way of doing scholarship and the power that e-versions of things have, I think have really changed the way that people are using these collections. <laughs> and that is, so, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I just want to point out, we, we did not look at the Beinecke data. Beinecke has been the Center for German Studies at Yale since the founding of the Beinecke. And that is where the area studies development happens in German studies. So, what we're showing here is more the commodity kind of material that we <laughs> uh, Jim Engel, I teach literature at Harvard. I had a quick question about the slides that were shown earlier, and then also a question about how to interpret all the data we've been looking at has been fascinating. A quick question about one of the earlier slides is, what kind of dollars are those? Are those raw dollars from each year, or are they 2016 dollars, or are they inflation adjusted, or? Not inflation adjusted. Not inflation adjusted, yeah. okay, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. So yeah. you really have to think about them in another kind of way than yeah. they look visually. Yeah, I mean, they're, um, I mean, we could have done done something where we looked at like 100% if you wanted to get a better sense of the ex percentage that's going to special collections versus e-resources. But it does give you a sense of um, how the growth of the collection funding has progressed uh, over the past 15 years. So. The question I had about interpreting a lot of the data we saw is so a series of questions popped into my mind, some of them a little frightening. One of them, does this mean people are reading less? It's a serious question because I have taught a long time and a lot of my colleagues who've taught a long time always raise this question. Another question would be, are faculty assigning things to students which require less physical presence in the library? I think often that's the case. Another question would be, what are people doing with books that are out of copyright? I think most people in the humanities now are looking at them on Google Books or elsewhere, and they are not going to the library. They can actually download a lot of those books and own them as PDFs, and I've done that many times, and of course many times I've seen that the book was in the Harvard Library, but now I have a PDF of it, and I didn't have to go and get it. Yeah. I think that's exceptionally common. I think it's exceptionally common, I think, for people to browse a book that is in copyright to see whether they want to take it out or not. 
whereas before they probably would have taken it out or at least would have had to go and look at it and browse it. And with better cataloging, which we often have now, people can tell from the cataloging information whether they want to take a book out or not. All those things tend to argue for less circulation and even less library presence because it is in fact not intellectually necessary to do that. So the gentleman earlier raised a question about how do we assess these uses and I think that's a very important point because it's changing very rapidly and for a younger generation even more so. So I, I don't know how to interpret all those circulation figures and print and it, but you know, another question too is, it's much easier to download something electronically than it is to walk a half a mile to a library and look at a book. And human nature being what it is, I saw those hundreds and hundreds of thousands of e-downloads, mm -hmm. and uh, sure, we all do it. So I'm not really quite sure what it does mean. It's good to know, but I think it's very, very hard to interpret. So, uh, oh, I'm just, um, uh, it's uh, 18 after, I don't know. Oh, let's go a little bit longer. Yes. No, I think that, I think the, the points that you raise are um, quite um, relevant and they are questions for us to, how do we wrestle with that? How do we think about a research agenda within, um, academic research libraries and the broader scholarly community to maybe help us um, tackle some of those kind of questions. So uh, um, I liked that, you know, the start of the discussion highlighted that, you know, we do have to have qualitative as well as quantitative inputs to our thinking about collections. Um, I echo what many have said already about some of the weaknesses of the data or some of the challenges in interpreting it. Um, you know, you could talk about some of the ultimate sources of data, some of those startling numbers about, you know, uh, e-journal uh, article downloads and so on. Um, I'm not going to name names, but a major publisher of electronic journals has admitted that, you know, the data we use, which comes from them, um, is inflated by a factor of four. So that line at the top could be brought down to one-fourth, and they've admitted that, for, at least for Princeton. Um, but leaving all that aside, there is an automatic tendency to take data, which are simply data points, they exist there, they're not, even if you eliminate the fuzziness of the sources and so on, and to turn them into sentences that lead us to, or in the direction of some conclusions. So we move from what you might actually get from the data, which should be, um, you know, we say things like, well, this, these materials are not used. That's a sentence in the present tense, but the data is telling you something about the past tense. They have not been used. Doesn't mean they are not used or will not be used. That's A. And B, it doesn't even tell you that they have not been used. It tells you they have not been used within this finite time span. How many millions of books do we have that circulated an unknown number of times before the implementation of your online circulation system to count that data. Unknown, right? I mean, unless you go back somehow and count all the stamps on all the circulation cards from the older books. I'm just bringing this up as a point. There's a natural tendency to say sentences like, well, this stuff is not used, but that's not exactly what the data tells you. And if you care, as Dan Hazen certainly would, about the long tail and the importance of the long tail of low use for the future of research, you have to avoid that tendency if possible. So I, I, oh, I do want to, oh, yeah, I, I do want to say that I, we tried as much as possible not to put interpretations on the data, but we, we, we have a tendency to do that. However, I would, I would sort of come back to, to this gentleman was talking about what this really, I, we're seeing some shifts and I challenge that maybe that long tail is gonna become much, uh, even longer. It's just, there's so much stuff that, that's out there. Is, you know, and the reality too, when you think about the life cycle costs and the costs that we put into maintaining these collections, 
we have some challenges to, to tackle here, and I think the reality is, is that I really do think that we're at the beginnings of a real shift in the way people do research. That's my belief. I, I don't, I don't, I, I have, I'm starting to see data. I'm starting to think about it a little bit more deeply. I'm seeing it when I teach an undergraduate class. I see very different ways of approaching that, not only from the grad, from the graduate students as well as the undergrad. It's starting to really shift. And I think that we're, we don't do ourselves a service if we don't think about that. I just wanted to add that David's absolutely right. These are descriptive statistics. They are not meant to be predictive models. I think it would be really interesting to explore the idea of trying to come up with some predictive models. To, so to Sarah's point about you know the book that's been on the shelf for 12 years and it hasn't been checked out in that 12 years, will it ever get checked out? I mean, can we devise those models to help us figure out you know, where best to put our resources. I don't know if we can, but I think it's an interesting question. I think many of us have tried also sometimes with remote shelving facilities to try to make that determination as well. I mean, the way that we're thinking about our big, our big scale collections, we've tried to do that. And it's, it's, it's an interesting approach. And I think now we're trying to do it collectively. And so I think it's really interesting. I'm Deb Wallace from Baker Library, Harvard Business School. And knowing what I know about Dan, he was a, a great uh, provocateur, but he was also a man of action. And so I put on the table, I'll, I'm happy to take the lead and bring a group together, who wants to look at how can we think about usage beyond circulation. I would never, ever lead a discussion with my dean about circulation. We have spent a lot of time talking about the impact of use that is beyond circulation. I'm thinking about some work we did with uh, Professor Gibson from MIT who was doing a MOOC and um, wanted access to uh, Hooke's um, Micrographia. And we were able to enable her access to that material here at Harvard that then went viral uh, through her MOOC and through other videos about her woodpecker talk. So that's the impact. Circulation to me is not a valid measure anymore. And if we're thinking about collections as service, then how are we enabling the use of those materials in other ways? So if anybody wants to have a little think group about how might we create some other kinds of measures, I'd be happy to facilitate that. Thank you everybody so much for engaging in this conversation with us. And we want to leave you with Dan's words from 1992, more relevant than ever, that the current situation, while complex, is also one of unprecedented opportunity to work together. Thank you very much.